I am an immigration attorney. I am a partner at Melter Hellrung. We are in Chicago. We are a, an immigration law firm. We work on immigration for not just the U.S., but the world, helping people secure visas to really any country they need to go to. Um, today's presentation will be focusing on, you know, first and foremost, the new sort of new entrepreneur immigration rule. Um, but we will be, um, you know, I'll also, because that's not really a full hour of discussion, also be presenting a few other options that are available to entrepreneurs um, from an immigration perspective. So uh, I welcome anyone who has, you know, any sort of personal in information they're looking for. Um, you know, if it's a super personal question, I'm always happy to take um, meetings after today's presentation. So you know, if you're looking for general information, I encourage you to share you know, comments with you know, here in the the Zoom chat. Uh, if it is something you know very personal to your like very particular situation, I would encourage you. I'll have my email afterwards, and if you want questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm very happy to to set up a time to, to speak. And I'm Laura Frerichs. I'm the executive director of the Research Park. I had a chance to connect with Meltzer Hellrung and learn about their work in immigration. Uh, because they have done some work with the Technology Entrepreneur Center on campus as well. And they've worked with Polsky and some of the other entrepreneurial communities in Chicago. So I know they have an interest in helping um, entrepreneurs as one of their efforts to assist with immigration. And if you're not familiar, there have been some recent rule changes in the new administration that we thought would be uh, especially of interest to those that might have uh, otherwise a challenge in being able to launch their businesses here in the U.S. as graduate students, as an example, that are on international visas and what would be needed to qualify for the new, what they're referring to as a parole program that allows um, entrepreneurs to lawfully stay in the U.S. So excited to learn more about that today. Laura, thanks, Matthew. I think uh, we've, we've gotten some more friends who've joined us, so I think we can go ahead and kick off uh, today's presentation. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. And I believe you're zooming into us from Chicago. So just off the road. Yeah. Um, well, wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining uh, the call. I'm really excited to, to be here to talk to everyone. Um, uh, so I, you know, I apologize. I have a cat who is just meowing in the background. So please ignore that. Um, <laughs> The joys of working from home. Um, so yes, so let's start. Today's presentation, we're going to first talk about the international entrepreneur rule, but my goal is to also talk about um, other options as well, because as I said, the international entrepreneur rule is not an hour conversation in and of itself. So today, I'm going to give you a very, very, very brief introduction to work authorization and company creation. Uh, we'll talk about a brief history of the, the rule itself and why we're talking about this today. Um, and then we'll go into some other options from an immigration perspective for entrepreneurs. All right, so in terms of people who are eligible to work in the U.S., um, people, it sort of breaks down into four categories. People who are U.S. citizens and permanent residents, they can work for anyone. There are individuals who have work authorized visas. Um, they might have a general work authorization and they also potentially can work for any company. Um, and then there are people who are given, you know, often very specific work authorization, often company sponsored to work for a very particular company in a particular role. Um, so um, today we'll be mostly focusing on, you know, we'll really be focusing on those third and fourth categories. By far, the fourth category is the, the most prevalent of what we'll be talking about. And the reason we have to talk about work authorization is that by law, anytime someone is working for a company here in the US, the company needs to fill out a form I-9. And that I-9 says the company has authorization to hire the person. And the person who is employed by the company is the one saying, you know, here is the work authorization I have. Um, companies can be, you know, the inspections on these are you know, few and far between, but the penalties can be significant for companies that are not compliant. Um, we're talking well over $2,000 per um, 
violation and if there's companies are hiring people who they know not to have work authorization, there can be even stiffer penalties. Um, so for some companies, there are I-9 fines in the millions of dollars. Um, but for entrepreneurs, that's far less of a worry. Um, E-Verify is an additional online program that can help verify employment. Um, and basically it runs documents through governmental databases like the DMV or Department of Homeland Security to see whether the documents appear to be accurate. Um, all right, so let's ask the question that I often get, which is what visa status is required to start a company? Uh, and the, the answer is really simple. There is no visa status you need to start a company. Um, people often think that they need to be in a particular visa to actually go about starting a company. Um, when it comes to creating an entity, you know, just creating an LLC, creating a C-Corp, there is no visa that is necessary. You don't even have to be in the US. Um, that's really the easy part. Creating the entity, creating an LLC, C and a C Corp is a very, very straightforward process. The question about what you can do for that company once you've created it, that's where it gets more complicated. Um, and so by and large, you know, if you want to be working for the company, and by working, I do mean someone who is often doing this as their full-time job, someone who is getting paid by the company a salary, a wage of some kind, you need some kind of work authorization. And that is really what the thrust of this presentation will be about today. Um, and it looks like I slide is slightly out of order, but let's go to this. Um, so we're going to be talking about the international entrepreneur rule first. And the international entrepreneur rule, you know, is generally a program that has been designed specifically with the entrepreneurs in mind. So the U.S. immigration laws are really pretty cruddy as it comes to entrepreneurs. Um, they have not been designed with entrepreneurs in mind. They have been designed with employment in mind, often with larger companies. So for foreign nationals seeking to start their own company, there can be a lot of, um, there's a lot of challenges to starting and working for your company. Um, there are certain people from certain countries where it's easier depending on your credentials, like if you've had a PhD and you're doing work related to your PhD, it could be easier. But for you know, the average person who has a great idea and wants to start a business in the US, there are very, very significant hurdles to starting a company um, and getting a visa. So the Obama administration, under pressure from mostly venture capital groups, um, tried to create an end around around this. So, um, this is a little bit of background. You know, mo all the visas that we have um, are basically created by Congress. Um, so the president cannot create a new visa class independently. So if they want to create a new entrepreneur visa, it would require an act of Congress to do that. And as everyone knows, um, getting new immigration actions through Congress is basically a um, fruitless idea at this time is just way too much gridlock to make progress because even if there is a good idea that everyone agrees on, no one's willing to advance just one part of like an immigration reform package. They want sort of a comprehensive idea, which is why things that, you know, potentially 67 senators agree on still don't go anywhere. Um, the, the next thing is, so the Obama administration came up with something saying like, hey, we have discretion to let people into the country under certain circumstances. So let's create some sort of formal program that allows us to use our discretion to get people to come to the US as entrepreneurs. So they created this thing called the International Entrepreneur Rule, um, which allows people to enter the US on parole. Um, and parole is sort of a weird thing which I'll go into a little later, but it's basically, it's not actually a visa, it's just sort of a discretionary entry into the US. Um, this was created at the very end of the Obama administration. It barely was in effect. And then the Trump administration came in in 2017 and sought to end the program before it even began. And so what they did is they created a 
the delay, they tried to delay the implementation. Um, and that uh, program was, um, so the Trump administration sought to end the program. And when they did so, uh, basically they did so unlawfully. So a couple of companies sued the Trump administration for the way that they were trying to end the program. And one of them was my client, a client called Occasion, which is a company in Chicago. They were successful in challenging the end of the program. Um, but it was sort of like a fleeting victory. So they determined that the Trump administration had done it improperly. But when they, um, the Trump administration basically said, okay, uh, we'll put in a, the correct regulation. And when they did so, um, they created a regulation basically ending the program. Now, that was sort of a, a sort of odd thing. So they created this regulation. Um, they said, we're going to end the international entrepreneur rule. Um, many, many people commented saying, hey, don't do that. That's not a good idea. And they actually never finalized the regulation for basically three plus years and just sat in regulatory, regulatory purgatory where nothing happened on the regulation. So it wasn't technically voided, but everyone assumed the program was going to end any day. So no one applied. Um, so even though the rule had not been formally ended, no attorney would ever advise their client to go pursue the program because if the program ended, it could be such a thing that basically the, the person who was on the parole program would have their work authorization terminated that day. So no one would ever apply for it. So even though it was a regulation was created and never went into effect, then the Biden administration came into office and they withdrew that proposed regulation from the Trump administration, which means that now all of a sudden the international parole rule, entrepreneur parole rule, which has been like bandied about now for five years, is finally really in effect. Um, so even though it has been on the books for five years, um, this is really the beginning of the program. There's no, so few applications have been made that it's basically brand new. Um, attorneys and you know entrepreneurs are really navigating it for the very first time. So let's just talk about quickly about what is uh, parole. Um, Laura, you asked about are we seeing applications? Um, you know, I don't have a client. I filed one back in 2017 when the rule was temporarily suspended that uh, we were successful with, but. Um, I haven't seen an application to date right now where someone has gone about it. You know, it's still one of those things where it's really fact specific. Um, but it would certainly, you know, if someone had the right facts, I would definitely apply right now if it was the most advantageous option. So um, I just put this information here. I'm not going to read all the information on this page, but just so that parole is a sort of a weird concept in immigration history, immigration law. It is most people who enter the U.S. in a visa, they're technically in a status, which means they're lawfully present. Um, someone who is on parole is just sort of a discretionary entry, which means that they're not technically, they, they, they can basically be sort of removed in theory at any time. They can be denied entry a lot easier. So you know, lots and lots of people are on parole. <coughs> comes from all kinds of different reasons why people could be on parole. Um, but the big difference is that you can't really change easily necessarily from parole to other visa statuses. You can't change as easily from parole uh, to a green card. For a lot of these um, actions, you would have to leave the US and come back in. But for the purposes of operating a company, um, which is you know, the first and foremost concern of someone who's applying for this program, the parole, even though it is not the same thing as having a visa status, is still definitely desirable because it gives you that ability to start working with your company and be paid a salary. Okay, so let's talk about what it actually takes to qualify. Now that you have all that background that you may or may not have actually cared about, let's talk about what it takes to actually apply for it. So the first thing is that the company has to be new. To apply, the company must have been formed within five years of the date of the application. So if your company is more than five years old, you don't qualify. 
um, or an initial application at least. The second thing is that the applicant has to be an entrepreneur. Um, so you have to be someone with at least a 10% equity stake in the company. So someone who has less than 10% does not qualify for an initial application. Um, and you need to be actively engaged with the company. You can't merely be someone who holds an equity for stake, but really isn't active in the management of the organization. Um, so someone who is you know, an active manager, someone who's like a CEO, COO, CTO, you know, someone in that kind of range of functions um, and has the relevant equity stake is going to satisfy the first set of qualifications. Um, for, from a company perspective, you can have up to three entrepreneurs on parole. So, you know, if there's a five founder group where each person owns 20% and all of them were foreign nationals, um, they would not all be eligible for parole. Only three of them would be. So there could be, depending on the company, some questions about who is going to apply, how, you know, what other people might get different kinds of visas. Um, but definitely at least three people can apply, up to three people can qualify for this um, program. And then this is really the, the most challenging part, which is how do you demonstrate that your company qualifies for this program? And so you need to meet one of the three below. The first is going to receive uh, uh, an investment of at least $250,000 in capital. And this is, you're looking for, unfortunately, not just $250,000 in capital. So if you bring your own capital to it, or you get a friends and family raise. Unfortunately, from the perspective of this program, that alone is not enough. The government is looking to see whether you have investment from noted investors. So you're looking for existing venture capital groups that have a track record, angel investors who have a track record, accelerators who have a track record. If you are getting someone who is going to invest who does not have a track record of investment into other startups, unfortunately, that is not going to count towards that $250,000 number. So it does mean you're, for perspective of this, like if you are an, if you are an entrepreneur and you get two different, you know, um, in term sheets and you get one from a much more uh, uh, notable, venture capital group than a, like a fledgling venture capital group. And the terms aren't as good, but you're depending on this program to get your work authorization. It might mean that you're looking at the less desirable term sheet. So this is this can have some sort of perverse consequences on how people choose what kind of funding to look at. It's one of the reasons that, you know, when you're looking at term sheets, not only should you have a corporate counsel to of course help you with that, you should also be looking at have immigration counsel to talk you through it because it really could impact your visa options as well. Um, the second option is getting state, federal, or local government grants totaling at least $100,000. Um, and that's a pretty straightforward thing. I, there's no, I, I'm not really worried from this perspective on like what agency it is, whether it's, you know, the NIH, the Department of Energy, the DOD, or a state, you know, program, whether it's the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago or anything else, like really any governmental award of $100,000 or more definitely will qualify. And then there's this sort of catch-all provision, which is providing additional reliable and compelling evidence of coming substantial potential for rapid growth. This is sort of a, this is the area where it's a great unknown. Um, there are so few applications that have been filed. Um, let alone how many have been filed under that category, that's hard to know what would be looking at. But I would say that if you had no other visa option and you say, you know, we went back and we talked about how you don't have $250,000 from a venture capital group, but you have a $250,000 raise for friends and family. If you raise that $250,000 and you've already done things like hire employees, you have like you're on the road to a working product or you already have sales of your product, I would feel to say, I would feel comfortable saying this would be a good faith application. But you know, because again, this program has just really been just revived and started, um, no one really knows how the government is going to review these. So the first and second criteria are pretty clear. The third one is really sort of the wild, wild west where 
no one really knows what the government will do if you submit an application in that category. So if you're approved, you then get 30 months in the US on this program. Um, the parole can be extended for an additional 30 months, so that's a total of 60 months for a total of five years. Um, at the end of that five years, you'd have to look for some other option, but that's a pretty good runway in five years. So let's talk about what it would take to, if you get it in the initial time, let's talk about what it would take to get an extension. So at the extension period, the ownership threshold jumps, drops from 10% to 5%, which of course is, would be, uh, which makes sense. You know, the idea here is that you're getting venture capital funding. If you're raising additional rounds, you might get diluted. Um, so the first way to qualify, at least $500,000 in additional qualifying funding. So that might go you from an angel round to a series A, or you know, uh, friends and family who are angels to a, you know, an initial seed round, depending on what your, your business is. Um, the second way is revenue generation of at least $500,000 per year or more with an average annualized revenue growth of at least $20,000, 20%. I don't really know how many, you know, that's only two years of runway, right? You got you came to the US, um, you had two and a half years. So that could be a pretty demanding category depending on what your business was already doing prior to um, getting the parole program in place. The third one is substantial growth, um, which is at least full five, full five full-time jobs um, created since the parole was granted. So not five jobs total, but five new jobs since the parole was created. Um, and then there's still that catch-all, which is you know, give us some other reason why you should be approved. Um, you know, to me, if I'm I have much more, I'm far more comfortable understanding what one and three are. Two, just because of the way it's worded, seems like one of the more seems a little foggy in terms of what that 20% means at you know how you're measuring it. And the fourth, clearly, as we were talking about the first one, that is um you know it's going to be something that you're going to have to it's who knows how the government actually reviews that so um you know from the perspective of who would you be looking at international entrepreneur parole um the people most likely to do it are honestly people who you know have a diverse funding base um so there are people who you know, you might, there's a lot of visas where the ownership might have to be located in one nationality. So you have a diverse group of people, um, uh, that would be it. Or there are certain countries where there's really no option for entrepreneurship very easily, like people from India, people from China. Uh, there's really no other really solid entrepreneurship options in terms of visas. This would be a really good option. So Lori asked, can the employees be students? Um, are you asking whether like the people who are employed can be students? Yes, and I'm guessing there's a challenge there because even if they could physically work 35 hours a week, they if they're on CPT, for example, that's going to limit their number of hours per week to 20 right. hours. Right. Um, you know, based on how I see other things, clearly the rule says five full-time jobs. Would I think that you know, in the other visa categories, um, part-time people can add up to full-time equivalents. So if like you had 10, 20 hour a week people working, that to me should be the same as five full-time jobs. But again, that's not, you know, that would be a, you know, a reliance on an equivalence from other, you know, immigration categories. Um, but you know, some of those, you know, clearly the company can hire anyone with a work authorization. Just sort of a question of, you know, who are we counting towards that job growth number for the purposes of the parole? Does anyone? Have, the next sort of slides are going to be on other visa options. So before I get there, I sort of want to open up the floor. Does anyone have particular questions on the parole rule um, that they would like to talk about? You know, generally, um, before I talk about other ideas. And Matthew, on the qualifying investment for the 250 or the later 500,000 for the extension, does that have to be U.S. sourced? So, for example, if there's funding from China that's from a venture firm or an angel investor in China, does that qualify? I'm sorry. Yeah. 
They're looking specifically at U.S. investors. Um, you know, do I think that if you you had like a million dollars from a notable um, investment firm in Brussels or London or Hong Kong that uh, that wouldn't be a good reason to fall into that third category, the additional reliable and compelling evidence? It seems like it would to me, um, but to, to meet the funding threshold as it is in that first category of $250,000 is just that that's your in, it doesn't have to be from US sources. And sorry, following up on that too. So many of our entrepreneurs pursue SBIR funding, which would be around that level. Of course, if they're internationally owned as a venture, they don't qualify, but say they have a US business partner and they can secure SBIR funding and the international co-founder wants to pursue this option, does SBIR investment count? I know you said state investments would. It certainly seems like it should. I don't see a reason why it wouldn't. So, Alan, you asked if there's any been approved. Um, there were, I think at the time that the Trump administration sought to end the program, they said that there had been 17 applications at that time. Um, I know I filed one of them. Um, I'm trying to remember whether we actually got to the approval or not, because we ended up getting the person a green card for another method at the end of the day. Um, but I, 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 my recollection is that we did get approval. I, I memory would have to be jogged a little from 2017, because uh, I don't remember, wasn't focusing on that application at the end. We got to another option that was more secure. Um, but uh, yes, I believe that applications have been approved, but I don't know if any have been approved under the Biden administration. Um, so I think that yeah, what, and you know, there've been so many changes at USCIS over the past couple of years that I think it's gonna be a very new, you know, approach and review of it. So. Um, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, the second question was, can the parolee bring their immediate family with them? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, so uh, individuals who are paroled can bring spouses and children under 21 with them. Um, spouses who arrive will then be eligible for their own independent work authorization. So they'll have to apply separately for an EAD card, which is an employment authorization card once they arrive in the US. Um, but once they have that employment authorization, they can work for any company in any role uh, in the U.S. Well, if anyone else has any other ideas, feel free to interrupt me going forward. All right, so let's talk quickly about some other visa options. Um, I'm not going to dwell extensively on any of these. I'm going to try to you know, be relatively brief about each option, um, but, you know, any of these options, it's always going to be very fact specific. Anytime I'm talking to an entrepreneur, especially a student entrepreneur, um, everyone's individual circumstances in terms of you know their what their business does, their educational background, um, their own immigration history, uh, what you know what their publication record looks like, uh, you know who else owns the company, investment plans. It's always going to factor into what visa options are best for that particular person. But the goal here is just to sort of walk you through the different options that might be available to different people. So the first option to any student um, is always going to be uh, the visas related to F1, which are OPT and CPT. So students graduating from programs generally are eligible for 12 months of OPT. And if you graduate from a STEM program, you get an additional 24 months of STEM OPT. Um, the first 12 months are incredibly flexible. You can basically work for anyone. Um, you can work paid, you can work unpaid. So for an entrepreneur, um, those first 12 months are incredibly flexible. Uh, for the next 24 months, they're a little bit more rigid. Um, so you can always, you can potentially work for your own company. Um, as I said, the first 12 months, pretty easy to do so. The next 24 months, should you graduate from a STEM program, um, you do need to have supervision and training available to you. Um, so for those on STEM OPT, the first requirement is that the company must use E-Verify. Um, in most states, E-Verify is optional. So you never, most states, including Illinois, you're not required to sign up for E-Verify just to have a company. 
um, to do work authorization. Um, the second thing is that for to qualify for STEM OPT, you have to file an I-983, which says who is your going to be supervision and training. For entrepreneurs specifically, that can be a little tough because if you're running your own company, how do you get supervision and training? Um, my general recommendation to entrepreneurs is that they set their companies up as a C corporation. When you do so, you will get a board of directors on your C corporation, and then you can have the board supervise you as the entrepreneur and CEO. Um, so that is, to me, the, the cleanest way to set things up if you are looking towards using STEM OPT um, as at least a part of your immigration plan. Um, I always encourage students who have OPT and STEM OPT available to them, even if they have good candidates for other visas, to always use OPT and STEM OPT. And the reason is just simply cost. Um, a OPT application to the government costs four hundred ten dollars. Um, almost any visa application is going to have higher fees just the government, let alone fees to an immigration lawyer. So this is by far the cheapest option. And while you are bootstrapping your company, um, this option is the easiest in terms of paperwork, the easiest in terms of cost. So I, I always encourage entrepreneurs who are students to always pursue OPT first as the first um, option, and then make a plan for what to do as the OPT is expired. One of those options might be H-1B. Um, H-1B is by far the most common work authorized visa in the U.S. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of H-1B workers in the U.S., but there's some very real challenges for um, entrepreneurs. The first is that if you own a significant stake of the company, um, you may not be able to get the visa. So there has to be what's considered an employer-employee relationship. And if you own the company, it may not be determined that you actually are like able to be fired by the company. Um, the second is that there is a prevailing wage requirement. So for any company that is bootstrapping or has limited funds, paying prevailing wages to a, a entrepreneur who is really counting on the equity as the long-term payout, not on a short-term salary, can be totally undesirable. Um, and then, of course, the hardest part about an H-1B is that there's just a limited number of them. So there's 85,000 total new H-1Bs per year. The demand way outstrips supply. Uh, this past year, there were 308,000 submissions into the lottery to determine which applications would be reviewed um, for those 85,000 new slots. So your chances of being selected are unfortunately fairly small. Um, and uh, you know, that is one of the hardest pieces. Uh, but once you do have H-1B, if you already have H-1B, um, you can be changed from one employer to another. I've worked with plenty of people who have had H-1B already um, and then are looking to change to their own new company. So you, know, you go work for Motorola or Caterpillar or McKinsey, and then you know, two years in, you're ready to start your own company, you change. It change your H-1B employment from one company to another. You're not subject to the lottery when you're changing employers. If you've already been through the lottery once, it's a one-time thing. Um, as I was, you know, talking about, you know, H-1B, it can be really challenging from a question of entrepreneurship. The other thing that beyond the ownership piece is that there's a question about the availability of work. And so there's always a question about you know, what work will you be doing? Um, and it's twofold. A, is there enough work to do? Like, does your company have the capacity to support you? So there are no financial requirements in H-1B, but I'm always, when I'm working with an entrepreneur, looking at H-1B, I'm looking at one of three things. One, does the company already have revenue? If you're already selling your product, great. Um, two, does the company have contracts showing that even if you don't have revenue today, you're going to be having revenue coming in in the near term future? And the third one is if you have neither of those, do you have funding to show that you can continue to support the company for some runway um, before you actually get to a revenue period? Um, the other piece in terms of work availability is really about the size of the company. Um, 
very, very, very small companies, like I'm talking about companies with one or two employees, there is a question about whether enough of your work is in a quote unquote specialty occupation. So that H1B is really saying, I am doing the specialty work, I the work that requires my degree to do the job. Um, while you might be, say you're an engineer and you're running an engineering company or a product with an engineering company with an engineering product, if it's a one or two person company, the USCI is concerned that too much of your work is being done on the administrative side and not enough of your effort is focused on your like core engineering skills. So my general recommendation is that to file for an H-1B that a company have at least three people. Um, my experience is that one and two person companies are really hard to get approved. Three seems to be the magic number where you can say enough of the work is being done by other people on the administrative side that you're focusing on that core like specialty skill set. Um, along the path of H-1B, there are specific visas for Chileans, Singaporeans, and Australians. These are the H-1B1 and the E3. They are very similar to the H-1B, but while they are technically capped, so there's a in theory, a limited number of them per year. That cap number has never been met. So Chileans, Singaporeans, and Australians can apply for these visa benefits at any time of year. Um, and the other thing is that because of the way they are adjudicated, they are not reviewed at USCIS as the only option. You can apply for them directly at a U.S. consulate. The U.S. consulate, when they're reviewing these applications, typically allocates somewhere between like four and seven minutes for an application. So there's a much lower standard of review, which makes them much easier to get, especially for entrepreneurs. So um, anyone who is from Chile, Singapore, Australia, these are really great options. Before I move on to some of the next things, does anyone have any questions on H1B, H1B1, or E3? Hey, Matt, I had a very good question. So when you say uh, the employee-employer relationship, uh, is it possible that somebody still owns the majority of stake? but has a board of directors which kind of supervises over them, or do you have to have a minority stake? You, yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are questions about it that, so you can in theory have majority ownership if your you know, um, board of directors is given permission in its powers to remove you from the company. So there's a question about, you know, creating power structures that are undesirable to you as an entrepreneur. So like you own 60% of the company, but you just gave your board the ability to fire you from the company, which of course is um, not something most entrepreneurs want to do, even if you deeply trust your board. So uh, definitely it is possible, but there are some very serious you know, pros and cons you have to weigh as an entrepreneur about whether or not that's something you want to go about creating. Um, you know, having many entrepreneurs who are in this boat will try to structure it such that you know, they functionally control the equity. Like they might give some portion of the equity to, you know, close friends or family, people they deeply trust so that they are diluted. I've certainly had clients where, you know, they've given the equity to their parents. They've given equity to a brother or a sister, to an uncle and to an aunt. Um, and so that they are diluted and there's other people who are, you know, not other owners that are controlling the company. But, um, you know, of course, that's also, that can be fraught as well because, you know, as much as you might trust your parents or your brother, um, you know, the company is very successful, you've given away equity. Uh, it can be a, you know, while you never wouldn't hope that your brother or your parents are well-intentioned, in theory, they may not give it back either. So. Um, it is, uh, you know, there are, it, it creates some, you know, challenging situations that you would have to think about very hard. Yeah, and one last thing. So from the parole question, I had one question. So when you said like five years within, uh, company should be formed within the five years, uh, what if somebody forms an LLC and then converts into C-Corp, does the initial date is still LLC date? Um, so reorganizing a company, would not be changed like the date like so like let's just say you created a company in 2017 as an llc um you reincorporate it in 2019 as a c corp but it's still the same entity just changing the entity type 
that would not like reset the date. Now, if you totally extinguish the LLC and you like moved all the assets to a brand new entity, you know, maybe uh, the entity is brand new, it essentially buys out the existing LLC. I think that could be, you know, if, the, if the government can figure out that you did that, they might do that as maybe some shenanigans. But I think that from like a perspective of saying like, was the company formed in the last five years? Uh, you definitely could say yes. All right. So the next visa option is specifically for Canadians and Mexican citizens. Um, this is called TN. It is, I need to update this. It is for no longer NAFTA. It is the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. I always, every time I do this recession, I'm always like, I need to update it. It's no longer NAFTA. But what we used to be known as NAFTA is now the US-Mexico-Canada agreement creates opportunities for people in very specific roles to come to the US. Um, this is a great visa option for hiring people. It's a terrible option for entrepreneurs. Um, if you are controlling the company, you're not really supposed to be getting a visa in this situation through this particular category. Um, so if you're hiring people who are engineers or management consultants or accountants, like this is very well designed. Um, if you are starting your own company um, and you're going to hold majority ownership, probably not as so much. Now, if it's one of the things where there are multiple co-founders and you're a co-founder with 10% equity, I wouldn't think that this is going to work fine. But if you are someone who owns 50% or more of the company, this is not an option I would pursue. Uh, but the, the TN is a, it's a really easy category to use if you have the appropriate education um, and you're doing a job that fits under one of the categories. Um, the categories I listed, listed here are some of the most commonly used ones, but not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, there are dozens of occupations on the skills list. Um, so it'd be something if you are Canadian or Mexican or seeking to hire a Canadian or Mexican, um, that is something that would be able to close it. Uh, the next option is a, an O-1. And the O-1 is for is a visa for individuals of quote unquote extraordinary ability. Um, an extraordinary ability is within your particular field that you are performing in. Um, so it's not necessarily about what you're educated in, it's about like, what are you actually doing? And it's self-defined. So you could be an extraordinary entrepreneur. You could be an extraordinary like um, agricultural entrepreneur. You could try to, you can always try to find the category as narrowly as possible. Um, the way the government looks at it is they have eight different categories. You need to meet three of them. Um, of those eight, you know, there's always going to be questions about you know, what to do to qualify, um, but it is fundamentally going to be a question of um, you know, what are what have you done thus far? If you're coming right out of a scholarly program. PhD students are usually very well situated to get these. Um, you can look at your research if your research is being applied to the company. That's a really good way to get an O1. If you're not coming out of like a PhD program. Um, it's going to be depend a lot more on what you've done with the company already, what your company has achieved, what kind of press the company is getting, what kind of impact it's having on the industry. Um, so, um, you know, the O1, typically when I'm working with entrepreneurs, they sort of fall into three categories of people who get them. The first are, again, people coming directly out of PhD programs where they're putting their research into a company. The second is people who have been serial entrepreneurs, so they've already had a company and they're starting a new company. Um, and the third are people who have been on some other visa to date. You know, again, that could be OPT, uh, that could be like the entrepreneur parole rule. And now they're looking for their next option. Their company has already been sort of operating in place for usually like three to five years. And then they were able to rely on the achievements of their company to date to say that they qualify as an extraordinary entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> the next option is treaty country visas, which are E2s and E1s. Um, individuals who are investors, managers, 
or essential employees in companies where the ownership is at least 50% in the same nationality. So common, most of Europe is here, Mexico, Canada are here, um, some um, Asian countries, Eastern European countries, uh, Australia, you know, you can, if the company is owned at least percent by people of that country, including the entrepreneur, you can potentially come to the U.S. to work on that company. And so there are three core requirements. The first is that the company meets the ownership requirement. The second is that there's been a substantial investment into the company. And substantial is relative to what the business is. Um, starting a new consulting company, your at, you know, the investment to a new consulting company might be pretty low, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. If you're starting a restaurant, it could be seventy-five thousand dollars. If you're starting a company with like a manufacturing capacity, it could be millions of dollars. Um, so it is a sliding scale based on what it takes to get your company operational. Um, and the last part is, is your business more than marginal? Um, if you are in a business where you will start selling things very quickly, but you will. You've developed like an app and you're already selling on the app store or you are, um, you know, you have like a product that is physical and is already going to be, you know, you'll be selling fairly soon. Um, those are good qualifications. Um, if you are in something that's more like a SaaS enterprise where it's going to take like two years to build something before you even potentially get to a sale, those can be more difficult applications because showing how business is going to be more than marginal. Um, it's going to require some prognostication and it's a question of like, how much runway have you built for yourself? And oftentimes where I'm speaking to entrepreneurs, they're sort of like, well, I know I have the first year of funding. My investors have said I'm going to come back for the second year after they see what happened the first year. And so those can be, those are, can be weak applications. Um, can the investment come from outside sources, uh, investors? The investment definitely can come from outside sources. You do not have to be the investor to get the E2. Um, uh, it's about the ownership. So in theory, you know, if, let's just pretend you're from uh, Canada and the company is 60% Canadian owned, but the investment comes from, you know, a U.S. venture capital group. Um, in theory, the application could be successful. Um, these applications are typically reviewed at the embassy of the country that you are coming from. Um, some of the embassies like to see more of that investment coming directly from the country that you're coming from. So again, if you're, you're Canadian, it could be desirable to try to get more of your investment from Canadian investors, as opposed to U.S. investors. But on like just the way the rules are written, there's nothing preventing you as long as the equity remains with the nationality from investment coming from other sources. Um, E1, the next couple of visas sort of depend on you having existing relationships outside the U.S. too. So the E1, the treaty-based visa, just like the E2 in terms of the ownership, but um, it's about trade. So if you are, a, you're having majority of the trade is between the U.S. and a treaty country, that will work in your favor. So usually something like this it is where there is a product that is already being manufactured or created in our country and you're like importing it to the US. Or you're having, you know, you have like a software design team um, that's working say in Pakistan um, and then all your clients are in the US. So that would be an instance where all the trade is between the two countries. Um, so it is fact specific where basically you have some sort of other existing product or work relationship in another country, and the majority of the trade is coming to U.S. clients or U.S. consumers. Uh, the last work authorized visa I'll talk about is the L1. And so the L1 requires you already have a company abroad, and then you're going to create a related company in the U.S. So that is where somewhere between the two companies, they're either parent subsidiary relationship, or the two are owned by a common set of owners. Um, you have to have a person who worked abroad at the qualifying company for at least one year. Um, the company that you're coming to the US and either 
an L1B, which is specialized knowledge capacity, which means you have some said knowledge that is unique um, to something proprietary about the company and that you have something relatively unique within that knowledge set. Or you're a manager or executive, someone who is managing people or you know, in the C-suite, CEO, CTO, COO, something like that. Um, the, this is something where you know, if you decide that the best way to start your company is actually start abroad, either based on market conditions or salaries abroad, and then you're coming back to the US market, this is, can be a very, very attractive option. Um, there is a way to, if you are even operating abroad, to start a new company and get a visa as basically the first person to come to the US. Um, so in that situation, it's considered a new office petition. You get a one-year approval to basically get the office up and running. And then at the end of that year, you can extend it if you create the conditions, continue to have employees in the US. All right, the last thing I will talk about is being a visitor. Um, many entrepreneurs I work with, they have started their company abroad, but of course need to come to the US for a variety of reasons. You know, meetings with vendors, meeting with clients, meeting with contractors. Um, people who are from visa waiver countries can come on ESTA and allows them to enter for 90 days at a time. Um, People who are from non-visa waiver countries come on a visitor visa, which is a B1 or a B2, um, and that allows them to visit the US for up to 180 days at a time. You can basically, in business meetings, you can set up your company while on these visas, but you cannot be on payroll, on US payroll, while on these visas. So these are really great for facilitating the kind of travel and infrastructure you need to pursue another visa option, but they are not the visas that you would pursuit to be here long term. And with that, that's pretty much that is the end of my presentation. So I really want to the last couple minutes we have open the floor if anyone has particular questions that they, they want to talk about. Thank you, Matthew. It was really good. Um, just trying to see if you wanted to ask questions. And I would emphasize that is like it is extremely introductory, clearly for any one situation that might give you a sense of things to start thinking about and looking into. Um, but for any particular person, you're going to have to definitely have a conversation with an attorney um, to um, you know, discuss what your best options are. Um, because there's, this is not enough of a takeaway to say, oh, I know for sure I should do one thing or another. Yeah. Um, I think Arpit's got a question. Yeah, and very quick one. So Matt, like we see all these visa categories, but I'm curious, like how, how mutually exclusive are the qualifications? For example, somebody has a PhD and they also qualify for that parole. And like, so when they see an application, do they see a holistic picture or do they, they are very, very categorical? Like, okay, he has five publications uh, or so you, you see what I'm saying? Like, is it like, very exclusive or is it like more holistic? How, what did you see? In terms of like for each visa category, like how does the government view it? Or are you saying, could someone qualify for multiple options? Say somebody has partial qualifications for two categories and one applies, decides to apply for one of them. Will they see that, okay, this guy overall has some uh, you know, potential? Yeah. So in terms of the way the government views it, they're going to view it as what are the qualifications for this particular category? So, you know, it, it is not holistic. It is very much, you know, these are the regulatory requirements, A, B, and C, whatever those are for that particular visa category. Do you meet the requirements for that particular option? Um, uh, you know, there's always some narrative where on the fringes, you can try to sway the government one way or the other. Um, really, you know, there's a lot of reasons to try to, um, you know, elevate some things that may not be core to the visa, but might be very nice in terms of telling a story um, about what the person has been doing. You know, um, for example, like on the H-1B, there's no press requirements, but like if we, you know, nonetheless, you might include if the company has gotten a lot of press thus far and said, you know, like try to say, hey, this company is doing great. Like here's all the great news that they've been generating. Um, no, that's not any part of an H-1B, but you might still 
include it strategically. Um, you know, when I'm when I and other attorneys are consulting with people, many people might have multiple visa options, um, and there are going to be pros and cons to different strategies. Um, so you generally will look at you know what is if you know someone has multiple options, you potentially qualify under multiple categories. There's going to be a calculus about like cost and timeline and benefits of different visas. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, I, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, um, you know, the O visa spouses are not work authorized, but on the L visa spouses are work authorized. So even if someone is a better O candidate than an L candidate, if they have a spouse they want to work in the U.S., will often try the L first because then the spouse can potentially work. Um, and then be like, okay, well, if it doesn't work, we will go to the O. It's less desirable, but we know it'll get approved. So there's going to be the facts are going to really depend. Always going to, you know, determine the path for each person. Thanks, Matt. Sure. I know we're about out of time. Sebastian had a question. Read his in the chat said, Can the investment come from the outside sources, i.e., investors, or does the investment have to come from the E2 visa applicant? So, I think it was this, yeah, question. yeah. So, so the E2 for E2, it does not have to come from the applicant. So, one of the ways you can qualify um, for an E2 is as the investor yourself, but you can be coming as a manager or executive, which means that you know, the investor, someone else is the investor in the company. Thank you, Matt. Quick question. Go for it, David. Um, so, say my co founder has a long term tourist visa, multi entry, mm -hmm. and sure. he's been coming in and out of the country. Um, and say we decided to apply for a one of these um, work authorization visas, would that hinder his ability to come into the country on a tourist visa? No, it does not. Uh, merely applying for a visa should not does not interrupt his, um, you know, his ability to come as a visitor in the meantime. Perfect. So and anyway. would you, um, what the? I'm assuming you would maybe leave uh, your contact info. What's the best way to contact you for, for the consultation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, my email is on the last slide here. Um, at melter at melterhellrun.com. Um, and you can definitely contact me there. Thank you. Awesome. Great presentation. Yeah, as part of the, we will share, I think, the recording of this for the participants so you can reference again. And these types of services are really important for those that are launching new companies. And many of, I think, the majority of our new entrepreneurs at Enterprise Works have international co founders. So you are not alone if this is something that you're trying to work on. And if you are applying for our iStart program, which provides um, introductory assistance for professional services to launch companies associated with the university and enterprise works. These types of um, services are eligible for that iStart program as something that you can request for some funding assistance from our office. So just wanted to um, reiterate that there are ways to help you get the right kind of assistance you need. It is a great example of some time when you need a professional, somebody, as Matthew described, who's been through it before and can weigh the different options with you amongst the other legal decisions you have as a company, and these are not the only ones that you will have. So thank you, Matthew, for offering your um, expertise on the topic. We learned a lot today. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for having me. I appreciate uh, everyone these days, especially during the summer, taking time to speak with me. And um, again, if anyone does have additional questions that are more personal, please uh, let me know. I'm happy to just have a conversation.